Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Ofra, and also Michael Glansberg, uh, and everyone in uh, Tel Aviv and here in Jerusalem who made this, uh, uh, well, actual, I learned, I have to say that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, when I was working on my dissertation, I actually had three advisors um, simultaneously, not one after the other. Um, and um, one of them was a, an old friend of Charles. Another one was a former student of Charles. And the third one was Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I remember, uh, so as part of the work, um, I uh, spent one year um, at the philosophy department at Harvard. And I remember when, when I um, arrived um, at Logan Airport, I, I immediately uh, took the subway uh, to Harvard Square uh, and went straight to uh, uh, Charles' office and uh, knocked on the door. And uh, then uh, you came, Charles, and you opened many doors. Thank you very much. Um, now, the, the other two advisors, who are, of course, Dirk van Dalen and Rick Thiessen, uh, I admit that uh, I have already been critical of some of their ideas in print. Uh, I haven't done so about you, Charles, so <laughs> I should like to take the occasion and make so mildly... <laughs> So in his book, uh, Mathematical Thought and Its Objects, Charles Parsons argues that we do not have intuitive knowledge of the principle of induction, which may be stated as a schema if A holds of zero and for all X, if A of X, then A of the successor of X, then for all X, A of X. Where A, of course, is a placeholder for any well-defined predicate on the natural numbers. Now, a well-known fallacious attempt at justifying the principle of induction runs as follows. Charles quotes it. Um, if x is a number, then by the introduction rules, we reach x by beginning with 0 and taking a succession of steps from y to the successor of y. Then, by a parallel succession of steps, we can show that a holds of y, that a y holds for each y figuring in the construction, and therefore that a of x holds. In fact, for each x, we can construct a formal proof of A of X by beginning with A0 and building up by modus ponens using A of X implies A of SX. As Parsons commands, as a proof of induction, this is circular. The construction of X by a succession of steps is itself inductively defined, and it is by a corresponding induction that it is established that A holds at each point in the construction. Now, in the intuitionistic literature, one actually finds this circular argument. Uh, for example, in Trollstra's Principles of Intuitionism of 1969, in Trollstra and Van Dalen's Constructivism uh, in Mathematics of 1988, and Dumet in Elements of Intuitionism points out that there is no uniform proof skeleton for each n, except if you do presuppose induction. But he holds that we recognize all the same that the operation of chaining at each n and applications of modus ponens is an operation that will yield a proof of a n for each n. But I do not see how that argument fares any better. That said, Brouwer, in his dissertation of 1907, claims, uh, claims that we have intuitive knowledge of the validity of the principle of induction. He says, complete induction is an act of mathematical constructing which is already justified by the basic intuition of mathematics. It is not surprising, then, that when at the beginning of his dissertation Brouwer claims intuitiveness of addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, the examples of constructions that he gives simply instantiate the straightforward inductive definitions. He only gives the examples, he doesn't give the, the general definitions. One never finds in Brouwer attempts at accounts for the intuitiveness of these operations of the kind proposed by, for example, Berenice and Parsons. Likewise, in the notebooks in which Brouwer drafted his dissertation between 1904 and 1907, induction is occasionally commented on, but certainly never to put it into question. In an undated draft letter of the same period as the dissertation, Brouwer says, I replace the axiom of complete induction with the mathematical construction act of complete induction. 
and show how, given the intuition of time, this is nothing new. But in spite of what he says here to uh, Professor de Vries at Utrecht, in the dissertation Brouwer does not actually show this. And in 1912, in his inaugural lecture, Intuitionism and Formalism, the wording Brouwer chooses for his claim is that for finite numbers as understood intuitionistically, induction is evident on the basis of their construction. But again, he gives no further explanation. A brief account of the justification that Brouwer nevertheless must have had was presented by Dirk van Dalen in his paper on Brouwer's dissertation at the conference 100 Years of Intuitionism in Syrizy in 2007. Uh, I'm going to, to, to read it, um, but uh, it's a familiar argument, so I, I, I think you don't need a handout. Um, given a of 1, and for all n, a n implies a n plus 1, we want to show for all n, a n. To show means for a constructivist to present a proof. Well, we have to keep in mind that already in 1907, Brouwer was aware that proofs are constructions. He spoke of erecting mathematical buildings and fitting buildings into other buildings. We may assume that there is a proof A1, small a1, so here I should have made slides. Um, now a proof for, for all n, a of n implies a of n plus 1, is a construction C, that for any given n and the proof small a of a n, yields a proof C n a of a n plus 1. So the pr it yields a proof C that is a function of N and A, and A was the proof that um, uh, N had this property, and then this function C on the basis of that gives you a proof uh, that N plus 1 also has this property. And uh, so uh, then you prove this. Uh, you, you get a second proof that uh, A holds of 2 by applying this function to 1 and the proof for 1, and then you iterate this. Hence, parallel to the construction of the natural numbers, we obtain the potentially infinite sequence of proofs A1, A2, A3, that is a proof of for all n A of n. End of quote. Now, at first sight, Brouwer's argument then must have been the same as the later one, familiar from, for example, Martin Love type theory, uh, quoted in MTO, Mathematical Thought and Its Objects. But that is not the case. All the difference is made by the fact that Brouwer's conception of proofs as languageless mental buildings is alien to Martin Love's framework and hence demands separate treatment. And something similar can be said with respect to uh, Kreisel's remarks about induction in his theory of constructions, uh, the 1960 paper in France and then the, the 1962 uh, LMPS paper. Mm. There, there, Kreisel says that uh, what, he, what he should like to do in his theory of constructions, uh, he notices that you, uh, once you have a uniform function that will get you from proofs for A of n to proofs of A of n plus 1, uh, then you can just iterate that and you just go on till you stop. Uh, he said all you have to do is follow this chain of, uh, of constructions. Uh, but he says the problem is in my, in my theory of constructions I cannot express that idea, just follow it. For Brouwer, of course, that would not have been a problem, but we'll get to that. I believe that Van Dalen's reconstruction is correct and should like to develop a more detailed presentation here that makes it clear, in Brouwer's own terms, why for Brouwer knowledge of the principle of induction is intuitive. That is at the same time an attempt to show, in terms of Brouwer's notion of intuition, that and why induction goes beyond iterating the successor operation, as of course it must. Now, Parsons in MTO and earlier writings holds the opposite view, that we have intuitive knowledge neither of the validity of induction nor of the principle of iteration. That is the principle that any total operational numbers can be iterated any number of times and yields a natural number again. I will compare Parsons' position with Brouwer's, and this may be as good a moment as any to remind you that Charles actually has visited Brouwer, and in a sense defend Brouwer's view. Of course, Brouwer and Parsons have different conceptions of intuition. I will not argue that Parsons is wrong once his own conception of intuition is granted, as I do not think that that is the case. But I will try to make two points. The first is that Husserl's analyses of time awareness can be used to justify in some detail Brouwer's claim that the principle of induction and inductively defined operations are intuitive. 
The second is that there are certain elements in Parsons' discussion in MTO that, when developed further, would lead to Brouwer's notion as analyzed, or at least something similar to it. So for Parsons, intuition plays two roles in the foundations of mathematics. Intuition of objects falling under a given concept shows that the mathematical concept in question is not empty. And intuitive knowledge is more evident than knowledge of other types, in particular knowledge whose justification involves appeals to principles of reason. But unlike Brouwer, Parsons is not a constructivist, and intuition has no overall legislative role for him. He does not require that all concepts in mathematics be instantiable by intuited objects, except for those at the bottom of our conceptual edifice. Other concepts then arise as combinations and idealizations of the lower ones, but there's no requirement that we have intuitions of objects that fall under these higher concepts also. Naturally, an account is then needed of which idealizations are legitimate and which ones would go too far. Parsons says this will depend on the theory of reason. He develops a number of ideas on this in the last chapter of the book, but my concern here, here will rather be with his views on the intuitive part of mathematics. So we distinguish intuition of objects from intuition that a proposition is true. For mathematical intuition specifically, Parsons takes the objects of intuition to be strings of strokes. He allows for the possibility to see specific inscriptions of such strings, tokens, as types, following Husserl here in holding that sometimes imagination of the token can found intuition of the type. The first thing Parsons says in defining intuitive knowledge is that we have intuitive knowledge that P, if P can be seen to be true, and the quotation marks are Parsons, um, if P can be seen to be true on the basis of intuiting objects that it is about. He then generalizes this by counting as intuition of an object not only an actual perception of one, but also an imagination of an arbitrary one. Otherwise, we could not justify the claim that it is intuitive knowledge that any such string can be extended by placing one more stroke at the right. An arbitrary string, Parsons says, may be imagined in the way we imagine a large crowd at a baseball game. It need not be part of the content of that imagination that the crowd consists of exactly n people. Some of you will have read Borges' book Dream Tigers, where you will find the argumentum ornithologicum of God's existence. Uh, I shall ask Charles about that afterward. Intuitiveness of an operation is explained in terms of intuitiveness of a proposition. An operation will be intuitive if we have intuitive knowledge that its defining equations are valid propositions. As I mentioned, Parsons argues against the intuitiveness of the general principle of induction. His objection turns on its essentially higher order character. The principle does not speak directly about objects that are intuitive in his sense, but about all predicates defined on these objects. On Parsons' conception, intuition that is only possible where all types involved can be instantiated in perception. Likewise, he argues that the principle that every operational numbers can be iterated is not intuitive. This principle is closely related to induction because a simple way of defining an operation inductively is to define it as the iteration of another operation. For example, addition can be defined as iteration of successor, multiplication as iteration of addition, and exponentiation as iteration of multiplication. Parsons' reason for denying that our knowledge of the validity of this principle is intuitive is that in speaking of every operation, it does not speak of any concrete operation on objects that could be given an intuition in his sense. That does not exclude, of course, the possibility, the possibility that certain specific operations that are usually defined inductively are intuitive after all. It is just that, in such a case, this intuitiveness has to be concluded to on a different ground than that they can be defined inductively. An example is addition. Addition is usually understood according to an inductive definition such as this one, a plus zero is equals a, and a plus s of b equals s of a plus b. Parsons accepts an argument proposed by Bernays that here an alternative understanding is available that does not depend on iteration. If a is given an intuition as a string of strokes, um, so I, I gloss over all kinds of uh, subtle details and distinctions that, um, of course, uh, take up a large part of the discussion in, uh, in MTO, but uh, I, I think that for my present purpose, uh, I, th I think I can leave that uh, aside, but maybe I can't, so you, you'll tell me. 
Um, so if A is given in intuition as a string of strokes and also B, then so can A plus B because the strings representing A and B can be concatenated in one step without iterating through them. I am not convinced that we can really make do without an appeal to iteration here, for we have to know that the new object, which surely looks like a string, indeed is one. In other words, we have to know that the operation of concatenating strings is type preserving. And I do not think that we can know this without having verified at least once that we can iterate through a whole concatenation by actually doing it. I will leave this doubt aside for the moment, but we'll come back to it later. For multiplication, one may propose an argument analogous to that for addition. Multiplication is usually understood in a way that depends on iteration. A times 0 equals 0. A times S of B equals A times B plus A. However, given strings A and B, we may obtain A times B directly by replacing each stroke in B by a copy of A. In fact, we are then doing the same thing as when we constructed B, except that we now take A as the unit instead of a single stroke. The Parsons notes that this way of understanding addition and multiplication does not easily generalize to exponentiation. The way I would elaborate this is to say that in the case of addition and multiplication, if we leave aside the objection about type preservation, we can indicate how to transform an image of the function arguments into an image of the function value without invoking any arithmetical concept, let alone iteration of arithmetical operations. Only direct manipulations of the image strings are required, such as copying them, concatenating them, and replacing one string by another. It seems that all such direct manipulations of strings can be understood in terms of part-whole relations. But the relation that exponentiation determines between one of its arguments, the exponent string, and the string representing the result of the operation, namely to indicate the number of iterations of multiplication needed to arrive at the result, is not a part-whole relation. For example, the salient relation between 3 and 8 that is established when performing the exponentiation 2 to the power 3 is not that in a certain construction of 8 strokes, a string of 3 strokes enters as part. Of course, there is a part-whole relation between a string of 8 strokes and any 3 consecutive strokes in it. But that relation is not brought about by carrying out the operation of exponentiation. This seems to rule out that exponentiation can be understood in the same concrete sense as addition and multiplication can. Um, I have here some remarks about um, Bernays' argument that you discussed for intuitiveness of exponentiation, but um, in the interest of time, uh, I, I try to err on the short side. So I'll leave it out for the moment. And I turn to Brouwer. I need some water. Brouwer says that mathematics is developed out of a basic intuition, or ur-intuition, that is based on what he calls the perception of the move of time. Here's a well-known quote. The perception of the move of time, that is, of the falling apart of a life moment into two distinct things, one of which gives way to the other, but is retained by memory, and with a continuum in between that connects the two things. If the tuity, that's his contribution to the language of Shakespeare, if the tuity thus born is divested of all quality, there remains the empty form of the common substratum of all tuities. It is this common substratum, this empty form, which is the basic intuition of mathematics. Did you write that in English? <laughs> uh, sometimes. The, uh, th this passage, uh, passages of this kind uh, exist uh, in, in Dutch, in German, uh, and in English. Yeah. For Brouwer, then, um, and I should also say um, that uh, this, sound, this sounds much more Kantian than it really is, but uh, that is not my topic today, at least not, not during this talk. For Brouwer, then, the objects of intuition are not, as in Parsons' model, strings of strokes, but objects constructed out of inner time awareness. But the objects that are intuitive in Parsons' sense can, I think, be mapped to objects that are intuitive in Brouwer's sense. The strokes in Parsons' strings can be mapped to successive intervals of time. 
Intuitiveness of operations and of propositions are, in the abstract, defined in the same way as Parsons does. I claim, but will not argue for it at this point, that all arithmetical principles that are intuitive knowledge for Parsons are also intuitive knowledge for Brouwer. On the other hand, if a certain principle is not intuitive on Parsons' account, it may still be on Brouwer's. Brouwer identifies the number two with the tuity. Once I have created the tuity as an object, time moves on again, a created tuity sinks into the past, and this, when I decide to turn my attention to it, will then become one component of a new tuity. Thus I obtain an iterated structure, a tuity, one part of which is itself a tuity. Brouwer identifies this new tuity with natural number three. Time moves on again, I can repeat the same operation, in, in effect a successor operation, and obtain the natural numbers. So Eric Palmgren once observed to me, if you use brackets to notate the tuities here, writing, them, writing down Brouwer's numbers gives you exactly the church numerals. Brouwer calls the successive construction of iterated tuities the self-unfolding of the empty tuity. Brouwer's account of the intuitiveness of the successor operation is based on the insight that we can obtain intuitive knowledge of whatever structure inner time awareness exhibits without first having had to construct that structure ourselves. For Brouwer, it is clearly the ordinal concept of number that is basic in the genetic sense, and the cardinal concept depends on that. And note how here the part-whole relation determines the order of ordinals, unlike the Kantian account that we heard yesterday, where the part-whole relation defined the order relation on cardinals. That difference, I think, comes from the fact that in Brouwer only temporal intuition is involved in pure mathematics, whereas in Kant one constructs an image, which is a spatial arrangement, uh, although there was a suggestion by, by Michael that maybe we should widen the notion of image a, a little bit. Um, but I... To the extent that an image is understood as a spatial arrangement, uh, it depends on spatial intuition. The next step would be from the intuitiveness of the iteration of the successor operation to the principle of iteration in general. For an operation to be iterable, its range must be contained in its domain. We now construct two sequences in parallel, one being the natural number sequence, and the other the sequence of applications of our um, operation f, beginning with f of a for some given a. So we get in parallel two sequences, one, two, three, and so on, f of a, f of f of a, f of f of a, and so on. And we know that we can follow all the steps in the finite series of applications of f, because we apply only one operator, f, and its type uh, is such that it admits of uh, composition at every point. And then the, the object constructed last, of course, is the n-fold iteration of f on a. Since no assumption was made about f, this works for any f, satisfying the minimal constraint that it should be composable. In other words, if we accept n-fold iteration of the successor function, then, according to Brouwer, we should also accept the n-fold iteration of whatever other operation with the appropriate domain. No, I don't think that should be a condition. It, it's just the, the 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 very fact that you can that you have a construction for f of f of f of a. It might just stop then afterwards you can, you can see what happens. Yeah, yeah. No, it's that's right. It's composition first of all of the acts of uh, iterating, and then the result that that yields uh, that you will see afterwards. Those acts are all different. Yeah. So there is no circularity when we say that iterative structures are constructed in intuition by projecting from the iterative structure of time awareness. We will obtain intuitive knowledge of such structures not through acts of inference, I mean such structures as are present in time awareness. Um, we will obtain intuitive knowledge of such structures not through acts of inference, but through acts of reflection. Reflection in the phenomenological sense of turning our attention to an, episode, an earlier episode in our flow of consciousness. The structure of inner time awareness is not given passively altogether, for we have to engage in the appropriate kind of reflection, which is an activity. 
But that activity consists in objectifying the flow of time and its parts and phases. It does not form that which is reflected on. Note that this means that the form of inner time is not a categorical form in Husserl's sense, as Husserl holds that the constitution of categorical form consists in active formation by the ego. For a brief period, somewhere between 1906 and 1909, Husserl did think that the form of time is categorical. For example, in 1906, he writes that everything temporal is categorical in nature. And in a text between 1907 and 1909, he writes, the temporal form is not an absolute, but only a categorical form. But in view of the mentioned difference with respect to the ego's activity, that cannot be right. And indeed, when Husserl, around 1909, uh, discovered the absolute flow of time which constitutes itself, it constitutes itself as a flow. One is tempted to say that it unfolds itself. Husserl discarded the notion that its form is categorial. So there's a, a more basic in, uh, intuition of form in one very particular case uh, that's uh, even more basic than categorial, the forms that you get in categorial intuition. The notion of self-unfolding of the tuity includes the ideas that time is potentially infinite and that in particular every life moment will fall apart into a tuity, one part of which is a previous tuity. This is, as I mentioned, an iterative structure at the heart of inner time awareness itself. These ideas obviously cannot be taken to be empirical observations, but should be seen as a priori insights. They can be further explicated using Husserl's analyses of inner time awareness, and in particular his notion of retentional and protentional intentionality. The intrinsic ordering of the natural numbers as constructed intuitionistically, in other words, the iterative structure, depends on retention, and the intuition that the sequence can always be extended depends on protension. Similarly, when looking at Husserl's diagrams of time awareness, what leaps to the eye is their iterative structure the relation of each moment and its temporal characteristics to all preceding moments in the diagram and to all later moments remains invariant. So let me now turn to induction, beginning with a look at Brouwer's concept of property. Here's a quote from Brouwer's dissertation. Often it is quite simple to construct inside a system independently of how it originated, new buildings, as the elements of which we take elements of the old one, or systems of these, but arranged in a new way, bearing in mind the arrangement in the old building. The so-called properties of a system express the possibility of constructing such new systems, having a certain connection with a priorly given system. And it is exactly this embedding of new systems in a given system that plays an important part in building up mathematics, often in the form of an inquiry into the possibility or impossibility of an embedding satisfying certain conditions, and in the case of possibility into the ways in which it is possible. And now Brouwer calls the, the whole constellation of the old building, the new one, and the correspondence that you construct between the two a fitting in, in Dutch, inpassing. There is a familiar act-object ambiguity here. A fitting in as an object is given by two buildings and a correspondence between elements of these buildings. Such a correspondence is itself a fitting in again, and hence an intuitive mathematical construction. A fitting in as an act is the act of building up a fitting in as an object. In either sense, a property in Brouwer's sense stands in contrast to a primarily logical concept of property. One may suggest that a fitting in as an object is what is, elsewhere known, uh, is what is elsewhere known as a state of affairs, Sachverhalt. This brings me to Parsons' complaint that, I quote, Brouwer is not as clear as he might be about the distinction between intuition of and intuition that. Writers about Brouwer tend to be even less so, end of quote. Now, I confess that I, writing about Brouwer, have never stated my view on this, let alone clearly, but it has always been that intuition that is a special case of intuition of, namely, intuition of a state of affairs. In this I follow Husserl, who had learned the term Sachverhalt in this particular use from Karl Stump, his teacher in Halle, and the concept itself had been used by the teacher of both, Franz Brentano, although the notion of Sachverhalt does not originate with Franz Brentano, but, but th that's where they got it. The fact that Husserl saw things this way is remarked on by Parsons in MTO. Quote, 
Husserl seems to regard intuition that as a species of intuition of. Evidence of a judgment is a situation in which the state of affairs that obtains, if it is true, is itself given. Selbst gegeben. Because typically a proposition involves reference to objects, evidence will involve intuition of those objects, but they play the role of constituents of a state of affairs that is also intuitively present, at least in the ideal case. Now, in Brouwer's account, um, where we have fitting ins as objects, uh, as states of affairs given in intuition, one of the two premises of induction for all x, ax implies a of sx, means I have a construction method that, given a constructed number object x, yields a construction method to construct a fitting in for a of sx on the basis of any fitting in a of x. So now I, I use propositions to, to describe the state of affairs that would make them true. But then I can combine these two methods into one, that on the basis of constructions for x and for a fitting in a of x, yields a construction for the fitting in a of sx. Now that method is uniform in its, in its two arguments. Uh, so it is indeed a single function, a function from pairs of numbers and fitting ins to such pairs again. So so what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that I think I have here, so by an earlier, and then it um, yeah, so by, the, by an earlier uh, argument uh, that I discussed, we have intuitive knowledge that we can iterate this function. Thus, we are back at Van Dalen's account that I presented at the beginning, the account which looked so much like the one in, for example, Martin Luff type theory, uh, but uh, isn't. If one compares against the background of BHK explanation, although I think that there never was one explanation that BH and K all agreed on, but if against the background of the BHK explanation, we compare this to the circular proof of induction uh, that we saw at the beginning, one sees that in uh, the circular proof, we had to deal with infinitely many different functions, namely one function for each instance of the premise for all x, a of x implies a of sx. And uh, you need those instances uh, in order to get the modus ponens uh, running. But here we have only one function whose arguments, however, are no longer simply natural numbers, but pairs of numbers and states of affairs. But it is precisely this that allows us to reduce, in a sense, induction to recursion and then recursion to iteration. So this is a theme that, is, of course, is very well known from, say, functional interpretations, that uh, if you, uh, uh, you can reduce the, the complexity of the logic if you're willing or able uh, to make uh, the, uh, the object you're talking about more complex. Yeah. Now, in the dissertation, Brouwer states, but uh, characteristically does not explain, that the asynthetic, that the synthetic a priori judgment that induction holds generally is an instance of mathematics of the second order. This means that we proceed um, by viewing our mathematical activity mathematically. And Brouwer remarks that judgments based on mathematics of the second order, for that very reason, have no role in founding mathematics. Quote, one must, however, not try to base mathematics on such judgments. They are the result of viewing the basic intuition mathematically, and hence presuppose the basic intuition in the viewing as well in what is viewed. They belong to what we shall call mathematics of the second order. So, um, this is, of course, a manifestation of Brouwer's view that um, logic depends on mathematics, uh, uh, and mathematics does not depend on logic. So whatever you accept uh, in logic should uh, be a reflection of something that you already was able to do uh, purely mathematically. Um, I was about to ask how I was doing for time, but then... Hmm. Yeah, so maybe I had here a, a terminological remark, but I, I'll just keep it to. Oh, yeah. Okay, then I'll go. Okay. Um, 
Now, um, Parsons write that um, what Brouwer calls the original intuition of mathematics is not an intuition of iteration or of the natural numbers. I think one can regard Brouwer as holding that any natural number can be given in intuition. Iteration and the structure of the natural numbers arise through the self-unfolding of the intuition, but there's no reason to suppose that either is an object of intuition. The phrase intuition of iteration does not, so far as I know, occur in Brouwer's writings. But um, and the, the, uh, on the whole, that is true, that that phrase does not occur. Um, but there is one place uh, at the end of the dissertation where he says that um, the, the and so on, the, the dot, 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 um, is a construction element read off from the Ur intuition. And in a handwritten note to that passage, Brouwer writes that the, the and so on is among the polarizations of the Ur intuition. And these formulations seem to imply that the and so on is given as part of the Ur intuition, specifically as what Husserl would call a dependent part, a part that cannot be given independently. So to me, it, it seems that uh, Brouwer does think of iteration as an object of intuition. Uh, and so Brouwer, I think, disagrees with uh, Parsons here, but also with Bill Tate, who unfortunately left, um, who both hold that the general idea of iteration is not found in intuition. Um, now I arrive at my final section, which uh, consists mainly of some questions to Charles. As Parsons notes, Quote, although the concept of a string of strokes involves iteration, the proposition that every such string can be extended is not an inductive conclusion. A proof by induction would be circular. Now, in the Browerian account that we just saw, the circularity was blocked by arguing that there is one very special iterative form that is given to us without our having to construct it first. But Parsons, in his own setting, proposes a different type of solution, which is to say that to just know that the string of strokes can be extended, um, we do not have to think of the string we are extending as having been obtained by iterated application of adding one more string. Instead, Parsons says, we can make do with a proto-conception of string, in which we, so to speak, willingly forget about those iterations, and then we add one more stroke to it. The idea is that the proto-conception is rich enough to make us see extendability of every string, yet poor enough not to be able to get the circularity uh, going. But here one could, I think, ask the question about type preservation again. How do we really know that the result uh, that I get when I add one more string is again a string? Now Parson explains, in addition, that to see the possibility of adding one more, it is only the general structure that we use and not the specific fact that what we have before us was obtained by iterated additions of one more. This is shown by the fact that, in the same sense in which a new stroke can be added to any string of strokes, a new stroke can be added to any, any bounded geometric uh, configuration. But I would say that precisely for that last reason, uh, the fact that we can add this one stroke to, to this thing of which we ignore inner structure does not give us a purchase on the, the type of object that we will get. My second question. A, a, a Parsons acknowledges that the limits of intuitive knowledge that he arrives at are rather narrow, and that many will hold that this is due to the very restricted character of the concept, conception of intuition he develops. One particularly strong constraint Parsons work, works with is Kantian in the broad sense that intuition is intuition of spatio-temporal objects. However, Parsons explicitly leaves open that there might be different models of intuition, on which there would be intuition also of other types of objects. And he mentions Husserl and Gödel. I think that the material in the Gödel archive, reading notes and work for the revision of the dialectica interpretation, shows that Gödel was much more committed to Husserl's notion than he was willing to let on in either his publications or his conversations with people without too much interest in phenomenology. I think that much as Gödel's scholarship owes to Hao Wang, it is a pity that Gödel refused to discuss phenomenology with someone who was highly interested in it and came well prepared. And I'm thinking in particular here of Bill Howard. Um, and if you allow me, I, I want to read a, a quick anecdote that he sent me. Um, so this is Bill Howard. In the fall of 1972, I'm having lunch in the Institute cafeteria and in walks Hao Wang. We know each other from ASL meetings in past years. Hao Wang says, I come in once every two weeks from New York for a meeting with Gödel. He's making me read various parts of Husserl's writings, which I don't particularly want to do. And then at the meetings, 
He makes me discuss what I have read. <laughs> I told this to my friend Tannenbaum, and he said, Gödel is one of the greatest living authorities on Husserl. So I decided uh, that I should take advantage of this. So I went to the Princeton University bookstore and looked for books by Husserl. And there was one called Cartesian Meditations. I decided that since I was an expert on meditation, this was down my alley. I was right. So I studied this and also the two books by Husserl that Hao Wang told me Gödel was making him read. When I felt I was sufficiently prepared, early spring of 1973, I tried to get Gödel to talk about Husserl. No dice. Gödel had decided that Husserl was not on the agenda for any of our meetings, and that was that. So I return to my text. Um, <laughs> be this as it may, the questions to Parsons that I should like to ask on this point are concerned not with Gödel, but with Husserl. Um, one question is about Husserl's notion of categorical intuition. Recall that in MTO, Parsons says that we have intuitive knowledge that P, if P can be seen, quotation marks his, to be true on the basis of intuiting the objects that P is about. But he does not say much more about how we see this on the basis of those objects. Does the seeing involve any intuitive component other than that of the objects? In that case, we would arrive at something like Husserl's categorical intuition, which, however, seems to me to be excluded by Charles' remarks. But if, alternatively, the component that the seeing involves beyond intuition of the objects is itself not intuitive, what would justify calling the resulting knowledge intuitive knowledge? Another question is motivated by the fact that, although Parsons mentions Husserl and MTO, he does not mention the aspect of Husserl that brings Husserl closest to Brouwer, and which I have discussed or alluded to above, the intuition of inner time. It would seem to be a natural question, however, whether Parsons would uh, be willing to extend his notion of intuition with a Browarian or a Husserlian intuition of inner time. It is not clear to me whether Parsons has a principled reason not to. One may, of course, observe that given his long-standing engagement with both Brouwer's and Husserl's thought, if he had wanted to exploit the notion of uh, intuition of inner time, he would have done so by now. Yet in MTO, and it, uh, yet in MTO Parsons appeals to Brouwer's intuition of tuity twice. First, <laughs> as one way of seeing that every string of strokes can be extended, I quote, let us return to the proposition that any string can be extended. The idea that this rests on the capability of the mind is a very natural one, and in certain respects, acceptable. I have proposed two different ways of seeing this, one resting on the figure ground structure of perception, and one, Brouwer's, resting on temporal experience. We experience the world as temporal, and have the conviction that we can continue into a proximate future in which the immediate past is retained." End of quote. Secondly, in the criticism of Bernays, uh, where Bernays had written, we are conscious of the freedom we have to advance from one position arrived at in the process of counting to the next one, uh, and Parsons comments on that, it would take some argument to show that there is no appeal here to the temporal character of experience, such as we find in Brouwer. Uh, now, it is, of course, characteristic of Parsons' approach that he refers to two types of intuition, perception and temporal experience, to convince us that we have the capability to extend any string. However, Parsons, in his description and use of Brouwer's tuity, emphasizes the discrete elements in the tuity and their order, but never quite mentions the continuum in between the two things. But constructing discrete tuities from the parts of the flow of time is an abstractive act, what is abstracted from is a temporal continuum that keeps the consecutive parts together, the discrete consecutive parts. Brouwer recognized this. He, um, where does he say so? In uh, one of his notebooks he writes, the sequence omega can only be constructed on the continuous intuition of time. The, intu the intuition of the two things and the intuition of the continuum in between that binds them are mutually dependent, so that when one cannot accept the one without also accepting the other. A question to Parsons then is whether he means to do just that, and if so, whether that is possible. Do I have two more minutes? I think given the quality of your presentation, I think we should give you a few extra minutes. Oh, you're too kind, because I, I, no, I, I was about to say, <laughs> I, I, I may not have sufficient text to fill up the extra time you give me, but I, I have one more remark. I should like to close with a remark on impredicativity. Parsons accepts Dummett's argument that the notion of natural number is impredicative. Here is Dummett. 
The totality of natural numbers is characterized as one for which induction is valid with respect to any well-defined property, whereby a well-defined property is understood one which is well-defined relative to the totality of natural numbers. End of quote. It is uh, curious that Dummett, who raised this issue in his paper on Gödel's incompleteness theorem of 1963, does not discuss it in his later book, Elements of Intuitionism. But in any case, the intuitionist can advance the view that, although the natural numbers can be thus characterized, that characterization is not a fundamental one, which would be in terms of languageless constructions out of the basic intuition. Already in his dissertation, Brouwer remarked that circular definitions, which are, after all, linguistic objects, are harmless as long as one has an independent languageless construction for the objects defined. This, this foreshadows a very similar remark of Gödel's in his Russell paper, I think. Similarly, Myhill has argued that the constructivist can avoid problems that arise when it's pointed out that some particular way of defining the natural numbers is impredicative, and his argument was that to the constructivist, surely the notion finite or some equivalent idea such as natural number or ancestral is clear, whereas impredicative definitions are not. Now Parsons replies to Myhill that this alternative view depends on a dogmatic view on what numbers are and on the evidence of induction. Parsons adds that such a dogmatic view could possibly be attributed to Poincaré and possibly also Brouwer. I've tried to show that Brouwer's view on the evidence of induction is not that dogmatic. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think we would all have liked to hear much more of this, <laughs> but I hope you at least get a chance to read it. But uh, I think uh, Charles certainly should have a time to comment, and I think the other discussion will have to break into during lunch hour. Yes, I, I was inclined to think on reading an earlier draft of paper that uh, the difference between my conclusion about induction and uh, the one you attribute to Brouwer uh, had to do not with the conception of intuition, but the conception of intuitive knowledge. Uh, because the conception of intuition be in the first instance the conception of what is intuitive and what, what its structure is. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm less sure that I understand you than I, <laughs> I, I was at that time, in spite of, not through no fault of your presentation, just the, uh, it uh, invokes ideas of Brouwer that I'm not at all sure I understand. Uh, so I'm somewhat less confident of that reaction than, uh, uh, than I was earlier. Uh, I think in your remark about the, uh, uh, how one sees that every string is, it can be extended, you pose a challenge uh, uh, to my view of uh, intuition which might be more difficult to answer than the one you pose about the bare nice art uh, ideas about addition and multiplication because uh, although I've rejected the claim that as general principles uh, iteration or induction uh, are intuitive I don't think I ever say that there aren't particular instances of them. Uh, well, uh, induction has the character of being an inference, and, and that that's, poses special problems. So let's let's consider iteration or primitive recursion. Uh, I've never said that there aren't particular instances of them that are in, uh, intuitively known, and the ones for addition and multiplication might have that character, although I didn't uh, in the book attempt to analyze that them to argue that they didn't do it or they didn't. Yeah. And that's, that's certainly a, uh, uh, a gap in, uh, in my treatment of these matters. Uh, but uh, I would 
I'd like to thank you for such an extended interpretation of Brower and also for a penetrating examination of some of the things that I've got here. Thank you again. And now you have lunch. Oh, and also, I have some practical information about the lunch.